Today we're going to talk about a very large topic of genomic uh, profiling in breast cancer, and a couple of statements can be made that are fairly non-controversial, and that is breast cancer has been an early adopter of clinical genomics for clinical decision making for nearly 40 years when it was first introduced in the early 1970s by Bill McGuire and his team at San Antonio for the estrogen receptor. And the second statement that we can make is that breast cancer patients are clearly doing better clinically. This was highlighted in a recent publication earlier this month by the British, cancer, by the British Columbia Cancer Agency in which they looked at a 7,000 patient cohort of women treated by molecular subtyping that examined the outcomes of hazard ratio of relapse in a cohort of patients in the late 19, sorry, in the late 19, 80s to early 1992 to the mid-2000s. And what you can see is that the pattern of relapse is in fact similar, but the benefit obtained by using these molecular markers in determining clinical decision making have clearly benefited the ER negative and the HER2 positive cohorts. It's impossible to review 40 years of clinical research using these biomarkers in breast cancer, so this is intended to be a very high-level overview slide that demonstrates that ER-positive patients have traditionally been viewed as having a favorable biology and being endocrine-responsive, to the point that we now use endocrine therapy out to 10 years in almost all of our endocrine-positive patients. The stratification for those patients who may benefit from that prolonged endocrine therapy has yet to arrive in the clinic to help us to select those patients who will receive that overall survival benefit, and certainly it will be challenged by the fact that many patients find the quality of life detriments associated with prolonged endocrine therapy indeed a challenge. Conversely, in the HER2 positive patients, we've identified patients who have this marker as having an unfavorable biology but HER2 responsive, such that now the integration of HER2 therapy into chemotherapy in both the adjuvant and neoadjuvant setting is standard of care. And as we've seen recently, the overall survival benefit at 10 years is now close to 10% for an absolute survival benefit, but at a significant cost and time commitment by both providers and patients. The cost at this point has certainly been proven for the overall survival benefit, but perhaps we can be more discriminating in our subselection of those patients. And finally, we've recognized the phenotype of the triple negative patients who express neither the ER or the HER2 biomarker, who are associated with an unfavorable pathology and are clearly associated in a small subset of patients as being chemotherapy sensitive, such that we now have chemotherapy incorporated along with specific targeted therapies such as our PARP inhibitors or tyrosine kinase inhibitors, demonstrating a survival benefit in a small percentage, but leaving subsets of subsets of patients where we don't understand the tumor biology completely and need novel therapeutics. So where this 40 years of clinical research has left us is with a divergent set of needs. We have patients with lower risk cancers for whom we have a management challenge, meaning that we need better careful selection of these patients in order to identify who will potentially benefit from prolonged endocrine therapy. We need to be able to monitor side effects and perhaps consider less or less toxic therapy as well as being able to reduce some of the healthcare discrepancies or disparities that exist based on lifestyle, education, or access. And then in converse, we have the higher risk cancers where we need an innovation challenge. We need better markers to identify who those patients are. We need to address them with novel therapeutics and be able to also eliminate some of the healthcare system discrepancies that block them from access to clinical trials and novel and innovative drugs. Over the next decade, our responsibility as clinicians is to move patients from the higher risk category to the lower risk category, looking at a variety of tools, including genetics, screening, prevention, and education, and better models of care. But if you look at the paradigm today, our clinical treatment is based on a relatively complicated clinical subtyping paradigm that many of our professional guideline committees have adopted. To the left, you see the 2013 St. Gallen guidelines looking at five clinical subtypes. They're defined by the current biomarkers of ERPR and HER2, 
and with the associated therapies to the left, to the right. For the first time in 2013, the St. Gallen's guidelines did recognize that there is, in fact, a general recognition of the superior accuracy and reproducibility of multi-gene assays with regards to identifying patients who may be at better stratified according to these multi-gene profiles as opposed to the historical IHC fish biomarkers. It's been nearly 15 years since the landmark paper of Dr. Peru and Sorley looking at the phenotypic diversity of breast cancer and evaluating that by microRNA for RNA expression to, I, to explain some of that phenotypic diversity. That signature was refined and further promulgated and such that it is now commercially available as a PAM50 assay available today uh, in many areas around the world. This intrinsic set of genes was developed absent any recognition of the ER, PR, and HER2 standard biomarkers, but correlated closely when you look at the subtypes that were developed by Dr. Peru. So luminal A is very typically associated with a strong ER positivity, just as HER2 uh, intrinsic subtype is associated with a strong expression of HER2. But these were not developed specifically around those biomarkers, what we've seen is that there are, in fact, survival and relapse-free survival differences between these subtypes. Moving into a slightly more contemporary time frame, researchers at the Netherlands Cancer Institute and the team at Agendia took a slightly different approach to this whole world of molecular subtyping. They honored the 40 years of clinical research that were based on the original biomarkers of ERPR-HER2, which drove, in many instances, the clinical adoption that we've just described. Using concordance between the IHC measurements of ERPR and HER2 and the microarray quantitative measurements of these same single genes, we identified three molecular subtypes and then looked at a differential hierarchical ranking of the genes to identify the downstream transcriptional transduction of these gene signatures as an indication of the functionality of the pathway. When you look at the comparison between the intrinsic subtype of Peru and the blueprint of Agendia, what we've seen is that the original gene set for the Peru was reduced and refined to a 50 gene set that constitutes today's clinical PAM50. And then the overlap of blueprint is about 30% with the original Peru subtyping or the PAM50, but about 70% of the genes in the blueprint molecular subtyping fall outside of the original intrinsic subtype sets defined by Peru and the PAM50 team. Part of that differential exists around the fact that when we're looking at blueprint, what we're attempting to do is to look at the downstream signal transduction of the protein that we've been measuring for 40 years by either IHC or single gene array uh, tests. What we've clearly identified in the clinic is the fact that there are patients who are ER positive, as in this example, but who clearly do not have an intact signal transduction to the level of the transcriptome. This has been identified as a result of mutations that exist in the ER, ER gene or splice variants that may block the downstream signal transduction. Ron Bose and his colleagues found the same exact uh, situation in the HER2 signaling cascade when he found eight activating mutations in the phenotypically negative HER2 population, breast cancer population, such that now 2% of our breast cancer patients who are HER2 negative may actually harbor one of these activating mutations and demonstrate clinical resistance to standard anti-HER2 therapies. So the presence or absence of the protein does not guarantee the downstream functioning of the pathway. What we're also found is that the team at the NKI and Agendia combined the Mammaprint 70 gene prognostic predictive signature as a differential stratifier in combining these with the three prognostic molecular subtypes of luminal, HER2, and basal. They did this in preference to the historical uh, discriminators or separators of KI67 or molecular grade and found that we could break groups into each of these molecular subtypes into a luminal high and low, a HER2 high and low, and a basal type that's predominantly high but a small percentage in the low category for downstream risk.
Mammoprint really looks at the intrinsic biology of the tumor to disseminate distant metastasis for that patient. What we have found is that these functional molecular subtypes are discordant with our current clinical subtypes about 23% of the time. And if we begin to ask the question, how relevant is this discordance in clinical practice, because that's the focus of today's discussion, when we look at the largest single biomarker study performed on the east side of the Atlantic, 5,600 patients, 69, 60, uh, I'm sorry, 6,900 patients were enrolled in a discriminating trial that looked at whether clinical subtyping versus molecular subtyping could be used as a determinant for the administration of chemotherapy. In this population of patients, accrued between 2007 and 2011, Mammoprint, Blueprint, and TargetPrint, so looking at the prognostic and predictive molecular subtyping of these patients, was examined. At last month's San Antonio Breast Cancer Conference, we began to look at what was the appearance of these molecular subtypes in contrast to the standard clinical subtypes defined by the St. Gallen group. And what you see in the luminal A population is that for the 2,700 patients defined as luminal A, about 10% of those patients were upstaged or upgraded, if you will, to a luminal B molecular classification. Now in the clinic, those patients who were designated as molecular luminal Bs may not have been allocated chemotherapy where there might have been a clinical benefit. Conversely, in the patients who were defined as St. Gallen clinical luminal B, about 55% of those patients were defined as luminal A by molecular subtyping and may have received chemotherapy without benefit. In the HER2 population, the concordance between luminal, between the clinical subtyping and molecular subtyping was only 50%, and the balance of those patients, 48%, were restratified or reclassified as being luminally driven, and in the classical HER2 amplified patients, up to 19% of those patients were reclassified as basal. Now the question of whether trastuzumab would have benefited those luminal patients in the dual positives, or the basal patients in the HER2 amplified is of question and great concern, especially when one considers the cost and toxicity. When you look at a prospective clinical trial design aimed at looking at response to patients with this clinical subtyping, we found in a large 1,100 patient series just completed accrual within the last month at 60 centers in the U.S. where we looked at pathological complete remissions as an indicator of response to clinical versus molecular subtyping. An interim analysis published earlier this fall demonstrated that for patients in the most common clinical subtype of ER positive HER2 negative, when reclassified by molecular subtyping, had a very low response rate when defined as luminal, but a very accentuated response rate when reclassified as basal according to the molecular subtyping. This was a substantial percentage of the patients in this neoadjuvant setting, 19%. Those patients may never have received the benefit of chemotherapy using clinical subtyping. Similarly, in the clinical ER positive, HER2 positive population with a modest response rate to neoadjuvant therapy of 27%, when reclassified by molecular subtyping, there was only a 4% pathological complete response, and these patients all received neoadjuvant chemotherapy and trastuzumab with a comparative 4%, one-sixth of the response rate in the group overall, and certainly significantly less than the confirmed both molecular and clinical subtyping HER2-positive population. And finally, in the highly amplified ER-negative, HER2 positive population where there's been a known high response rate when reclassified as basal, the response rate was less than half, and when reclassified and confirmed as being HER2 driven, there was a amplification. So in summary, what are these signals telling us? We've certainly made great advances using clinical determinants for subtyping over the past 40 years but current practice using IHC FISH may be leading us to either under or over treating patients according to these cohorts. Reliance on single gene protein IHC may no longer be adequate and molecular subtyping may certainly be a indication for the times to come. These are not yet at the level of practice changing, but they're strong signals that we need to be reconsidering how we're treating our patients in the clinic.
and newly designed clinical trials that are innovative, such as the iSpy2 trial, that are attempting to address this issue are needed for the next decade. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you.